Oh, come on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Much better. All right. So, welcome. It's the countdown. You know, it's like, what, week? How many weeks now we got? About four weeks? Four. Yeah. All right. Good. Exciting. It's getting close. Um, so, today we're going to do, we're going to do two things today. We're going to, uh, in part, focus on cases two of the three that we uh, sent about. And then we want to focus more on sort of the learning, the nature of learning in this class, and talk a little bit about that too, and some uh, coaching sort of thing. Uh, but first, uh, I think we have some guests today. We have a variety of guests today. Would you introduce yourself, um, starting with you? <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Andy. I'm uh, actually a reporter for uh, Mother Junk Magazine. I'm writing a story partly about me. Okay. But mainly about Jeremy. Mainly about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Former college. student. Yeah. No, you get stories written about you if you were a student that time. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Kristen. Uh, Art invited me to come in and crash and visit from DC. Where they call you the so let's check it out. Okay, welcome. Back there. Yes. Me? Yep. My name is Absalom Vilan. I'm an Israeli, former member of Parliament. And now staying here is uh, <coughs> Howard IOP Fellow. And have a group about the Middle East conflict. Okay. And uh, there's somebody else. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Dominic. I'm a friend of Michael's. Um, I'm looking into playing to that equal. So I'm just so getting to And you're from? I'm from Germany. Okay. Welcome. And was there one more? Is that everybody? Uh, oh, I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. There you are. Yeah. Hi, I'm Molly Joseph. I'm a prospective student at the Graduate School of Education and School here. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, let's see, so, do we have any announcements? Anything that people want to announce either that happened or that are coming up that they want to make us aware of? <coughs> yes, please do. Hi, so if you haven't seen the HK Speak Out Tumblr, um, I believe you can send it out to the class, but it's gotten a lot of really interesting stories. There are now about 100 stories on there um, from students talking about their experiences in class and with their identity, and tomorrow night, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. on the top floor of Kaufman is going to be a speak out where people are talking um, about what steps of action to take together. And there'll be a petition to sign for a, um, well, we're coming up with the appropriate name, but right now analyzing power systems for future policymakers training for orientation, uh, which is a diversity and privilege training. Unmasking power. Unmasking power, yeah. also a good one. I mean, analyzing policy systems is fine, but you know, <laughs> power, it's power system. Oh, power system. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, but we would love for all of you to be there. Um, it's going to be really fun. Now, is this a peak or leading to a peak or in the in it's, terms of peak world? It's like the smaller peak. It's not the Everest. <laughs> oh, okay. So this is a peak that's still ascending. Yeah, the Everest is going to actually be the presentation of the petition to the dean and the administration and having a lot of students. Is there a date for that or? Working on one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Talia. Uh, so uh, this Saturday is the second La Vida's conference. Um, it's a conference that uh, is part of my peak, and essentially uh, Mexican students uh, that study abroad, either in the U.S. or in other countries, will come together in the hope of strengthening our networks, and it kind of will work as an ILA, but just across sectors. Um, so it's definitely my peak in the sense that my project was to build continuity into this initiative. So hopefully a new leadership team uh, will take the batut, I guess, <laughs> during the conference. Um, so hopefully. You're, hopefully, hopefully. Well, we're, we're working on that. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, it looks good, but uh, <laughs> I think if you guys go, um, it'll definitely be interesting and um, it'll just be a good experience. So it's in the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Um, not too far away from here, uh, and I will send the details. So. Great. Good. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, this sir. Saturday is the um, is my sort of most up event for the essay I've been working on. It's an interfaith walkathon to mark the uh, one year anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing and to build uh, networks of um, interfaith relationships across Harvard's various graduate schools and the college. So we are meeting at the Steps of Memorial Church at the yard at 3 o'clock on Saturday and walking to the Santa Bombing at Coffee Square. We'll have lots of really engaging interfaith conversation, and you're all invited. Thank you. Uh, 
how we started last time, too. <laughs> yeah, Pat. How did you see that? How did you see that? Well, there was one particular um, person, I think, is her name, yeah. I think, who said she just never thought that she could go and advocate for her children in school to go and talk with the teachers. She just never had that power. She thought so. And then getting together with going to these meetings, and she found her voice. And she was now able not only to talk for her child, but for all the children. And that's certainly a theme. That's certainly a theme we've seen throughout throughout the semester. Um, those, those that combination of outcomes of uh, solving a problem, uh, building capacity, and developing leadership. Uh, and Pat's lifting up the point about the way in which, when when organizing is done well, then it isn't just problem solving. It's like there's all this development of capacity that goes on in the way she's describing. What else did you did you find a particular interest in that? Uh, yeah, Valerie. I thought it was interesting because I know that I personally struggle with this quite a bit, is um, with, especially when you have limited circumstances, the ability to, you can, you can definitely say what's wrong, but your ability to imagine what might be right uh, yeah. is challenged. And so it's fascinating to see this as a group. Um, the parents could say so much of what was wrong, but because they hadn't seen right, particularly for immigrant communities, they didn't know what could be right. And so the trip to New New York and just seeing what could happen and how things could be changes the conversation because you start your imagination is different. No, it's a great point, and and because it's not enough to say this this is lousy, but like what are we trying to build? Right. Yeah, what they sometimes people call that a vision trip, yeah. uh, where people in one community are struggling with the problem and it's been addressed somewhere else, and people get on a bus and go there. Uh, and come back, and it's not just that they see what's happening there, but there's all this bonding that goes on the way, and, uh, uh, going and coming, and it's kind of uh, almost, it's an organizing tactic, actually, uh, to do that. But it's a good point, because in this case in particular, there turns out to be quite a bit of that, doesn't there? In other words, they're called upon to actually come up with a series of ways to do schools, not just to stop doing something wrong, but actually to come up with ways to do it right. And as a result, it takes organizing a little bit further than just the advocacy part, but, but to the actual construction of what it is they're trying to do. What else, what else did you see there? That's, that's a good point, Todd. Yeah? I thought it was pretty profound how they allotted so much time and energy to a listening campaign. Yeah. Because when there's like so much urgency and so much passion, it's really easy to leave that behind and just like go straight into the action. Yeah. And how they built that into part of their system and they <coughs> Yeah, Amber, you've been doing a listening campaign or starting a listening campaign? Is that? Yeah. Huh? It's beginning. It depends when you start. So everybody's ready to listen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. They're not, <laughs> They're not listening yet. All right, so preparing to listen. All right, so this is. No, I thought they do a really good job in there of, of showing how the listening campaign, which is really what? What tactic is it? One on ones. It's just one on ones. A lot of one on ones. But in the way of, of gathering information, listening as a foundation, and in their particular organizing approach, where do they go from the listening? What's the next step they take? Yeah, so now we've learned this stuff, so now we've got to figure out, we, we kind of now got an idea what the problems are. Now we've got to figure out how can we deal with them? How can we, and then where do they go next? And then from that they move into action, and then the last loop is evaluation. So they're on this loop moving through hearing, uh, uh, learning, uh, formulating action strategy, and then learning from what they did, and so forth. Yeah, Eric. And just on that note real quick, I thought it was fascinating. Yes, in the Boston Globe, there's an article saying that Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, the IAF organization, the IAF, is launching a listening campaign for the next couple of months, especially around the anniversary of the marathon bombings. And it was, oh, just, really? it was really powerful to read that, too, that here's a 15-year-old organization that was built by Jim Drake doing this, and but they're still doing it. It's not yeah. just like a one-time thing either that you do when you found it. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, no, because it's a, it's a renewal. And uh, there's new things it turns out to listen to. Uh, and so the idea that one-on-ones are just at the beginning, it's like 
No, this is an ongoing, can be an ongoing. I didn't see that. That's great. Thanks for, for, uh, for yeah, because Jim did, they did a really extensive listening uh, campaign for the founding of Greater Boston Interface. Of course, this organizing also sort of comes out of that same tradition that we read about last time of Ernie Cortez in Texas, Industrial Areas Foundation, COPS, that organization that emphasizes the relational work so much as foundational to the organizing. What else? What else do you see there? Yeah, um, right, good. So it's really, yeah, it's really interesting. How much of that happens here at the med school? How much of this happens? Well, what do you mean, like outside? Of well, well where, where the attention is actually given to developing the community's notions of what they really want versus let's bring an expert in and the expert will. I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. No, it's, it's, really, it's really important. And, and I know in education it's a huge issue. Um, let's bring the expert in, we're going to fix it. Oh, and let's get some input. Uh, or let's engage the community, the community engagement or input, which is sort of like, let's get them to want what we want, usually. I mean, honestly. And so this is a really useful counterexample. But of course, it takes a lot of work, doesn't it? I mean, it takes a lot of work to, to really bring the community in in a meaningful way, and not just as a, as a pig leaf. Yeah, Mary. level was that the organizer came down with a particular model in mind that had worked very well in Oakland from probably a number of different reasons that the authors don't go into, and that the education that he and research that he, he provided for the community and that the places where the community was taken and the books that were read tended to generate a vision that was going to follow along the line of uh, here's the solution, it's this Oakland solution, and that's what they were going to take back to the school administration. So in a sense, it was a idea from the outside, but found now, to, but having been created within a one community without choosing to bring in that same idea to the other community. I'd like to get over it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I think that that's um, really valid, but it kind of makes me think of the visioning point that sometimes it's hard to else unless someone says like this is possible um, and so I, I can hear that um, I wonder if this is where that balance of expertise and like letting that listen to him take its course that it really did I guess something. where my, my pushback comes back is yeah. this is possible but so is this and this and this and I didn't get the B, C, and D in here uh, yes sir I want to follow up on that Mary I think so I had similar thoughts when I was reading through this but I think what was inter interesting for me to see was how the parents really took um, ownership and invested in the research process. So yeah, the idea came from models, right? So we all are, all of us are looking at models of community organizing success. But I thought it was really interesting to see that the parents took the initiative to, I think there were even some quotes of people saying, I knew nothing about education policy, and now you know I've spent this much time and I, you know, I'm a leader in this movement. So there is that. I wonder how they made the balance, though, yeah, of when they were going to um, uh, sort of seek uh, leadership from within the community. And then at one point, they did hire, um, I don't know if they're called consultants, but experts um, yeah. to help them in the design process. And so they decided that now it's time for us to invest our funds in these paid experts who are going to help us be a part of that process. So they had to decide at some point that, you know, this actually goes beyond the limits of our expertise in our research. So that was kind of a tricky moment for me, and I'm trying to figure out when you make that decision. When is a community not capable of being a part of that process? Well, I think it's uh, another thing to look at. Who was the organizer working for? Was the organizer working for the school district? No. Who was the organizer working for? Uh, the, the, the parents, the community. 
That's an important difference. That's an important difference for where for the school district who says we're the school district. We have all this now. Here's what to do. Come and join us in what we're doing. For someone whose um, accountability is different from that, um, and whose uh, goals at least align with those of the community, who's then and I think several the point saying here's a way to do it. And so uh, it may not be so much inside outside as in who owns it <laughs> and who decides. And, and, and who puts this thing together. I think it's a good point to raise. But I, you know, this whole insider-outsider thing is something we've noted ever since the beginning about the kind of source of creativity that that can be, certainly ever since Moses, at least. Uh, you know, and, and no, but the, the sort of, but the question is who decides on whose terms, who's in charge, whose interests are at stake is also really, really important. But I appreciate raising that. Um, yeah, here, yeah. But also there is a point where, I mean, you, I mean, going beyond like the inside or outside, you have to see other models. I think that they decided one point to go to New York mm -hmm. and to travel to see how other schools are doing the work. Because I think that also is, is hard about what someone said here that about the, what is real and uh, ideal. So if you don't see with your own eyes, yeah. I mean, th that brings a totally different picture yeah. to your thing. And it's very, very powerful to see that. And then you bring this, all this message, all these things to your community that you saw this and then it changed. I mean, maybe there are some people that are not believing yet, but after that they will believe on that project. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's the, the, the seeing, being there, smelling it, it's so different than hearing about it. I mean, again, that's another part of sort of, there's a way in which the information and the motivation kind of go together uh, in that. There's another piece of this case that's kind of interesting, which is, did you notice how they tried to then bring organizing practices into the actual operation of the schools? Did, did you see that part? What did you think of that part? See, in other words, it's kind of like, okay, we, we're fighting for this as opposed to that. But then when they began to set up those schools the way they designed them, did you see the organizing stuff in that? Yeah. There were the home visits yeah. that teachers made Yeah. they're putting that extra, I mean, I don't think, you know, you have to put in extra hours and extra time doing all of this work to build relationships. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, if, you know, there was a student who had just picked up a teaching gig after graduating, you know, from college, yeah. would have the same kind of interest in going to a town and having all of these one-on-one, -on -one. but maybe I'm assuming, maybe, maybe I'm making a big assumption about teachers. And their well, teachers. I think it's more a question of just considering possibilities, uh, whether schools have to operate the way they do. Uh, or whether there's different ways they could operate, and whether they could be different kinds of communities. I don't know, I'm, I'm going out here on the ed school turf here. Uh, but uh, it seems like we haven't quite got down how to make them work really well in this country yet. Uh, and so it's interesting thinking about other possibilities. And it's interesting taking the tools of organizing and moving them beyond simple advocacy to actually <coughs> making it happen in a way that develops leadership, that strengthens community, at the same time that whatever it is, provision of health care, education is. And we're certainly finding a lot of interest in organization of health care, in using organizing tools and tactics. I just wanted to point that out so we don't sort of put it in a get-up <laughs> and say, oh, this is what it is, but like think a little more broadly of some of these tools, because not everybody in this room is going to go out and be full-time organizers, I suspect. Uh, but there may be ways that these tools turn out to be quite useful. Uh, so that's another point of this. Yeah, there was another point. Yeah, switch. Well, I think coming from the Ed School, like, yeah. um, as from New York also, it's things to be like West New York. So the small schools, the small schools in New York were not a community like driven initiative that came down to the community foundation. Huh. They made, like, it's I feel like they understood that and they made a very conscious decision huh. that, like, we're going to derive this on our own. And I think for me, the powerfulness is that, like, so yeah. much of No, it's a great point. Yeah, Michael. And realizing, I mean, on the, on the same note, I mean, realizing that 
the, obviously the parents are also part of the problem somewhat. I mean, education is not something technical where you send your children to a school and then you know the school solves the problem and then they come back and they're ready. But you know, parents, oh, really? are, <laughs> parents, are, parents are part of this, and and I think this is this is just a beautiful example of you can, how they how they continue this path and then offer yeah. them and with the voluntary hours and, and all of that. It's so creating so much power, so much capacity, and sort of almost using the part that they had from the sort of the more the advocacy part, using all of these all of these resources in a mm -hmm. way that they created mm -hmm. and, and carrying them into the, the, the everyday life of, of the school. I think that's it's interesting. It's a mobilizing. It's mobilizing power over and turning it into power with, uh, in a, in an ongoing and kind of continual way. Yeah. Um, and I thought that it's kind of in, on the same line as that. And it was really interesting. Somewhere they mentioned the um, case that they created this culture so that even when a leader uh, leaves and a new leader comes in or somebody in the middle of the structure who's an important uh, part of it comes in they can assimilate into that structure mm. easily, which I think is a really interesting thing to think about in our own projects. Like, Because a lot of us are graduating and leaving, but how do we create a culture in, and create the capacity within our communities to carry forward with the same values yeah. and adapt to whatever's happening, but maintain those. Yeah. So that even when new people come in and out, they can figure out how to work with It brings a whole intentionality to yeah. it. And say we are we are expecting there will be new people, and so this is how how we uh, invite people in, introduce and continue what we're doing. That's that's a that's a great point. So. Um, I saw quite an interesting parallel with what Orange Hat were doing, ah. and that um, they were building a lot of power with in order to convince the, the powers that the uh, ah. they were a, a effective force on their own, and therefore ah. convince them to engage with them. Okay. And similarly here, I, I think there's a quote from one of the principals that said that. Part of the design process, which was the designing of the small schools, was what convinced her that she could engage with the parents in the first place. Huh. And so I think that made me think about how just just doing power with can actually could be a mechanism for change later on, um, especially when the, the main problem is that people don't think that you are a powerful stakeholder in the process. Yeah, that's a great observation. That's a really nice, really nice comparison. So. So there's a lot of juice in these examples. This is one case in this whole book of education of different ways people have used organizing tools to try to deal with schools and school, school challenges. And it brings out some interesting stuff. Um, but let's just shift to this um, other case, um, which is a little different. Um, this is the um, hospitals in Las Vegas. So we're going from the schools in San Jose to the hospitals in Las Vegas. Uh, and a little different tone, I think, uh, in terms of the writing. Um, th this uh, first case was written by uh, students, uh, researchers. The second case was written by the organizer. It's herself writing. So it's sort of two different, uh, two different uh, uh, angles there. And I just want to say uh, the world of unions and labor organizing is pretty obscure to a lot of folks. Um, I just want to say, to say just a little bit to try to help make this a little more accessible. Uh, the way labor law works in the United States, or doesn't work a lot of the time, frankly, um, especially in terms of uh, public sector, and, and in this case, healthcare workers, it points out they only got the right to bargain in 1974, I think it was, whereas other industrial workers got the right back in 1937. Um, but the outlines of a, of a union organizing process is say a group of workers want to organize. The first thing they have to do is figure out how to get the employer to recognize them as a unit so that they can choose their representatives and then bargain collectively with the employer. Um, and there's a process, uh, there are processes where the law applies of a majority signing cards that's called a card check process. Um, an election, a secret ballot election, where people <coughs> vote, the uh, majority will vote to have a union or not. Um, in other cases, it can be voluntary, um, but there's, there's a, a necessary process to get what's called recognition, so that now we're a unit and we're now bargaining with <coughs> the employer. Uh, once you get recognition, then there's negotiating a contract, and that's, uh, that doesn't happen automatically. Uh, so that's where uh, people formulate their, their demands, their interests, 
sit down with the employer and try to negotiate uh, an, an agreement, a labor agreement, uh, for two years, three years, whatever, whatever it might be, uh, and, until when the, the process is, is repeated. There's a third feature here about membership. Um, in, um, in terms of joining a union, um, in many states, if the majority choose a union and then vote for what's called a union shop provision, it means that everyone who works there will be expected to join the union or pay a fee to the union in, in a certain case for its representation. Uh, that's to deal with the famous free rider issue and all the rest. Now, in other uh, industries and states, uh, there's what's called right to work laws that prohibit that, make that illegal, which means that the union is constantly having to recruit members. And it's always a question people can join or not join, regardless of whether they're um, represented by the union or receiving benefits as a result of it. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's, is that helpful? Everybody know that already? Yeah, I, I didn't want to assume anything. So, so this, this is an account of a place where there already is recognition. And the person who's writing has come to, uh, to turn the recognition into an actual labor agreement, uh, to actually get a, a contract, a good contract, uh, because there's all kinds of contracts. And uh, so that's the setting for this. And what you see in it? I mean, uh, all the, this whole case is all about negotiations, really. And I know we teach negotiations here, and I don't know if we teach it quite in this way. But w what did you see in it? Yeah, Juliana. I really appreciated this point that you really need to have everybody in if you're going to win big. Um, and that when they started out, they thought like the cath lab nurses weren't going to be part of it, and there were also some differences between like worrying about Filipina nurses. Um, but they managed; they really stuck to their gun. Like we need this is actually affecting all of us. And once they were able to really sit down and talk one to one with some folks, everybody, almost everybody, I think eighty five percent of the. How did they how did they make real the notion that it is affects all of us? How did they make that real? Well, when they were talking with the one cath lab nurse, or I think he was an ER nurse, yeah. Sean. Oh, Sean the cath lab, yeah. They talked about initially he kind of was like bought into this idea because they also talked about like as hard as you, the union is working somebody, the the uh, bosses are working them just as hard. Uh -huh. um, so he was really bought into this idea that he was special, like he saw himself as different, so he didn't want to join the struggle. But um, when they started asking him about like why, when were you going to get a raise, and just asking some really concrete things, he was able to relate and like the I think they said like the light bulb went on. And yeah, so the, yeah, there was a very kind of uh, agitational encounter. She was challenging him. Uh, he was challenging his assumptions. Mm -hmm. But of course, that was happening in a context. And what was that broader context? How did they go about creating that broader context that this is not, um, here's two professionals sit down with two professionals and negotiate a deal? Uh, because that was a very deliberate strategic choice to not do that, but to do something quite different. Yeah? I think the, the idea of um, inviting them, even the non workers, to do the negotiation uh, meeting from the very beginning, that was very. Uh, effective way of getting them involved in what's really going on and, uh, and starting to realize that that would play in your benefit at the end. Yeah, it's really interesting. They did some more interesting things like that. What else did you see there? What else on this? Who made the presentation of the bargaining demands? The nurses. Yeah. See, this is not taken for granted. See, a normal set, oh, that's our negotiator. That's a lawyer that does that or whatever. See, she's really flipping it around and using the negotiations as a way to build power, really. So it's kind of like in this case, what's interesting about it is the negotiations aren't reflecting power that's already there. She is actually using the negotiation process to build power. And she's building power by the way in which she's uh, inviting everybody into ownership of the process. And uh, it can be really, sh I mean, <laughs> really shocking to the employer that's used to dealing with, you know, his buddy, they go drinking afterwards, and that's all of a sudden, the actual, the people show up. Not only that, but they're making the demands. They're making the presentation. 
and and then she she captures sort of and it's, and it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of, a lot of you know uh, training and preparation, but it has a whole different character to it. What what else in this in this interesting bargaining case? What else did you see? Yeah, Jeff. The desire to get ninety percent. set the stage, too, for a, for a strike. It would be yeah. followed strictly by a large number of employees. And, and it's interesting. So um, do you think that all that work they did made a strike more likely, likely or less likely? Less. Yeah. Why? Well, the communication that was involved, I think, you know, they, they, were, they just sit out of the park in terms of the negotiating, learning each other's What, I'm curious about other other thoughts on that because it's a very they really come down to the wire there. I mean, this is down to the wire deal. This is like you talk about stress. You know, we're worried about our peak next week. I mean, this was really and it comes through there. It's like uh, you know, ooh, what's going to happen? Yeah, over. Who, yeah, Andrew. yeah. I was surprised by the uh, strike section because the author seems to be saying, you know, we were bluffing. We weren't ever going to actually strike. You know. And that was really surprising to me because if she's still engaged in this kind of work, you know, presumably this is a tactic that's going to have to continue to be effective, and yet here you are saying we were bluffing the whole time. And you can see where a nurse's strike would really work, uh, could potentially backfire. But were they bluffing? She says they're bluffing. I mean, yeah. I mean I'll try and find it, but I'm pretty yeah. sure she says they were bluffing. If the company had walked out at the end, they were on that countdown. Five, four, three, two. I mean, I think it's an interesting question because um, it, you know, it's a question of sort of they seem to be busy trying to make a strike as credible as possible. I mean, what were some of the tactics they used to sort of uh, not only organize workers but also to uh, make credible to the employer that this could happen? What were some tactics they used for that? Yeah, Mona? Now the stickers are really, did I tell you about the time we took a vote not to be afraid? We were organizing mushroom workers in California in, in the Steakmate Mushroom uh, Company. It was, mostly, it was about 200 people, uh, mostly in, without papers. A lot of fear in this place. And through really intense <laughs> organizing effort, we got, I would say, a little over 100 to a meeting. I mean, it took a lot of, a lot of really intense effort. And in there, then, you know, what's, what's the problem here? Well, people have a lot of problems. But then uh, it was like, you know, people are afraid. I mean, uh, they could be, you know, call the INS and all this sort of thing. And so then uh, somebody said, uh, why do we take a vote not to be afraid? <laughs> Never heard of that before. That's kind of interesting. Can you vote not to be afraid? Well, it sounded OK. And so we said, OK, uh, is there a motion to not be afraid? Okay. Is there a second? All right, all in favor of being afraid, raise your hand. All in favor of not being afraid. Okay, woo, now we're not afraid anymore. So now, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Oh, well, the next day, guess what? We're all going to go to work wearing union buttons. And that was a decision. Uh, and so, of course, the next morning at the gates to this mushroom plant, uh, we were sure to have organizers with plenty of bags, just in case people forgot them at home, just to make sure. But the next day, well over the majority had union buttons on the next day in this place. And it just transformed the atmosphere. All of a sudden, the, the power to intimidate that the supervisors that were relying on, it sort of went away. Uh, and uh, it just shifted the ground. It, we won in an election there, I think, like about 150 to 30 or something. And this was like mostly people with no papers. So you know, sometimes these, these stickers or buttons or, because what you're dealing with is fear. That's usually the biggest problem. It's usually the problem, biggest problem in all this work that we do with other people, actually. And in that case, it's sort of a very clear kind of thing. Yeah, Maggie. Uh, well, speaking of union buttons, I wanted to add that one of the things that surprised or 
that uh, interested me in this case was the degree of intentionality that they practice with absolutely everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and for instance, when the nurses wanted to start wearing the union buttons, the organizer said, no, not yet, not <laughs> until we have critical mass because it'll show weakness. And That's when right. they were introducing themselves in the meeting, they knew exactly which end of the table they were going to start in because they didn't want there to be any um, back and forth at the beginning. Um, and I think yeah. that's where the, the role and the experience of the organizer is really exactly. important, even while the nurses were taking a, a larger role themselves. That's a great observation, and it's a great marrying of the expertise the organizer brings and the expertise that the people working bring about different things that together can add up to a much more. But the intentionality is really, um, yeah, I mean, um, everything, everything, yeah. On the expertise point, at the same time, um, the organizer said that their lack of expertise and experience was actually a strength because, for example, they didn't know it was crazy to get like 90% of the I saw that, yeah. And yeah. that I, I don't know enough to be afraid. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I, I'm also taking a social entrepreneurship class um, and we were talking a couple weeks ago about like Muhammad Yunus and the way that he didn't know anything about banks and was able to kind of flip the logic on its head yeah. and just totally reverse the system in a way that really empowered people. So. No, it's pretty interesting. It also goes back to the David story about what's, what's probable and what's possible, and sort of thinking in terms of possibility and not simply in terms of probability, because the probability would be that this could never work. And so, no, that's a great point. That's, uh, did you get the sense that uh, Jane was having a good time, the organizer? Did you see the humor in the whole thing? The Queen of Prussia and all that stuff? She's, she's in the first year in a doctoral program at uh, Berkeley this year in sociology. Uh, and so uh, and she's going to you know, be doing more work on organizing, you know, on, well, actually, she's writing a dissertation on the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting because she is writing from inside the spirit of what it is. That's why I really like about this chapter. Is that she really, there's a lot of joy in it, uh, even though it's really risky stuff. Yeah, other comments on this? Other thoughts about the, the, uh, and it's nice, it a, has a happy ending, right? Doesn't always, doesn't always. I mean, in this case, uh, they, they call it right. Uh, and, you know, you can see how, how the attention to strategy is just so profound here. And they call it right. But they're always turning strategy into action and then evaluating the results. And then that feeds back. How many people put on a button? How many people did this or that? So it's a kind of constant feedback loop that's going on there. Other comments on this? Yeah, Lori? I thought, too, um, uh, when it came down to that final night, I think how they had nurses come in from outside areas. Mm. When you talk about the one that's your nurse. I mean, she couldn't even have like done that perfectly herself. I think it was the stroke of luck or the atmosphere that they created. She stood up and said that the nurses in my hospital would Yeah, it's like testimony. It's testimony and solidarity. You know, if you think about the, the emotions chart that we use for, for public narrative about uh, urgency and anger on the one side, and then hope, solidarity, you can make a difference. You can sort of see that playing out in tactic after tactic here uh, in the way let's, that's a solidarity thing. And uh, when we when have people on strike for a long time, People coming from someplace and saying, we're 10, uh, like uh, from Arts uh, Dad's Union uh, at the UAW in, in Michigan. I'm here representing 2 million workers, and we're with you. And everybody's, yeah, that's great. You know, it's not exactly, but it's, 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 a, it's a form of support and expression that, uh, uh, that can be very helpful. Other, other thoughts on this? How many people have read something about union organizing before? I'm just curious, other than last week's. Yeah, it, it, it was often the place more people learned about organizing. Um, like uh, E.D. Nixon, who we read about as one of the initiators of Montgomery bus boycott, who learned as a sleeping car porter and part of A. Philip Randolph's union, the basics of organizing. So it's, uh, it's an interesting piece that's kind of 
gone out of things in a way that maybe some of us want to bring back. Let's uh, step back from these cases um, and look at the cases, uh, your cases, your project. How are you doing? Well, we heard some pretty good stuff today. But uh, I just want to share something we've been learning. Um, maybe, you know, when we explained um, the pedagogy with the bicycle, um, and we talked about the uh, head, uh, hands, and heart. Uh, you know, learning concepts, learning skills, and then developing the emotional resources to do it. Um, as we've been, and, and I think that there's, a, there's clearly a lot of that going on. As we've been doing um, analysis of some of the um, survey stuff on this class and also the distance learning class, it's kind of interesting. It's not quite like that. What seems to come out is that, yes, there's learning concepts. And people kind of, you know, yes, I understand what I understand strategy or whatever. Um, but then there's learning about self. Um, I'm getting a, a better understanding of my own values. I, I know, you know, what I, what I care about, that kind of thing. And, and then there's learning about interaction. Uh, my relationship to my committee, my relationship to others, my relationship uh, to uh, uh, people, you know, do people honor their commitments, people don't, that sort of thing. And it sort of seems that that's kind of how the learning seems to work. Um, and you wouldn't be surprised, wh wh which one do you think is the most challenging? Which one do you think is the most challenging? Depends, just based on your experience. You have self. You have interaction with others, and you have concepts. Which one do you think is most challenging? Well, the most challenging one for me is the interaction with yeah. others. Yeah. How many people would agree with that? The interaction with others is most challenging for him. That seems to be the case. That's really interesting. I mean, it's very interesting to think of it this way, because why do you suppose that would be so? Why do you think that would be so? You know, I, okay, I'm learning about myself, I'm learning these concepts, you know, but is this interaction with others, why would that be so, yeah? I think part of it has to do with the fact that you have so much less control over that element of that form of learning, and there's a lot of unpredictability, and, you know, you don't know how other people will receive the ideas that you're coming with. Yeah. Kind of so, and I think it's also important to try and make sure that you're not kind of projecting what you think uh, is going to happen, you know, and kind of interpreting how people respond. I think for me it's because it's the most emotional of the three. I think when I look at concepts, I can, they're pretty abstract. When, even when I look at myself, I can kind of step outside myself and evaluate my own thoughts and behavior. But when I'm working with other people and in a relationship with other people, there's always an emotional aspect to that. Um, in terms of protecting myself or putting myself out there with someone else. And then also caring about another person who, who I'm getting to know better through the world. Yeah, that's a good account of it, because emotions really are uh, deeply associated with sources of uncertainty. And, and it goes to Nada's point about where's the most uncertainty, where's the most unpredictability, where's the least control? You know, it's, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a scary domain. Yeah? So I, I guess I had a slightly different experience, because I felt like, especially in section when we would discuss some of the challenges that I was having, I thought that they were very much rooted in the relational aspect yeah. and others, but it kept kind of coming back to me. Um, uh, so, how? I guess it's so tell me how it yeah. comes back. So, to for you. example, um, there was something that we like we couldn't get our act together on something and mobilizing people. Which to project was this? With this is um, uh, trying to develop a community of graduate professional women at Harvard. Oh, okay. Um, using Good. the Lean in Circles as a model. Yeah. Um, and so just like developing that and solidifying that relationship with the Lean In Foundation, which was actually instrumental to our original theory of change and is now less so, um, it was something that I was actually nervous to kind of get the ball rolling on. And it was actually, once I had the conversation with people, they said, this is an actually part of what we need to do. You've just attached your, your idea to this. Um, and it's not actually part of what the group necessarily thinks, but I hadn't solicited that feedback to know that. So it, it sort of was putting the cart before the horse because I was putting the onus on the group when actually it was something oh. that I was still really wedded to and didn't need to be. 
Yeah, how about that? How many people have experienced something similar? I mean, where, but isn't, so what is the source of that when you say it's really about you, but it's about you with respect to what? Sort of needing approval from an organization. Or another. I mean, in, in other words, and so, and so how did you get, how did you get rid of it? What did you do? How did you do it? So it was basically actually you know, what I thought was a one-on-one -on -one to talk to one of the um, leadership team members about her circle that ended up being more about how the overall project was going, and I told her that it was something that I really wanted people to be more involved in, and she sort of questioned the premise of why we were even doing it anyway. And the more we sort of, it ended up being a reverse one-on-one, -on -one. she kind of coached me a little bit, um, I think without intending to, but I thought it was helpful because <coughs> I assumed that it was so fundamental to what we were trying to do, I hadn't stepped back to question it. Yeah. And she basically left me with, you know, if this is fundamental, just go do it. Like, don't be worried that they're going to say no. And actually, let's step back again and question whether it's even fundamental, because we might be barking up the wrong tree, which is what we sort of agreed in the end. Pretty interesting. What do you take from that example? Does any of that resonate with other people's experience? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pat? Totally so, because what this whole project has been here is really for me. And I must say, my idea is pulling me out to really think about. You just take certain things for granted, and but go back the beginning. What about you? Where are you really coming from? Why are you motivated to do these things? You really have to go back. And this is what it's really an exercise for me here now, to say, why am I into this place? Why am I doing such and such? Yeah. What is the passion? Where is it coming from? Go back and find out. Well, and I think the question is, what's pushing you back? What's pushing you back? What is it that we can, huh? Maybe a bit of fear of not wanting to deal with deep down who you are yeah. and where, you know, your whole soul, what's coming from, the whole of what makes you who you are. Yeah. And when do you have, when do you confront that the most? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I, in other words, I think the point is really, there's an interaction between self-understanding and understanding of the other. And, and, you know, you can sort of do a, a reflective, I actually realized at one point that I, was, that I had been teaching the same course in three different ways here. Um, and I taught a course for five years called Moral Leadership, in which we use the same framework, but it was reflection on, um, on texts, on classic black like religious texts, on uh, Huckleberry Finn, uh, for sources of understanding people write reflection papers about their own leadership challenges, and very much a reflective kind of thing, same framework. Uh, and then the public narrative class, which is the similar framework, only there you've got to um, you got to speak. <laughs> you can't just write about it to yourself. You've got to talk to other people. you got to engage. And then there's this one, which is, and, and the, you know, because now you've got to not only reflect on it, you've you got to actually go get it, get people committed to do stuff. And it was a little bit like an anxiety curve, you know? It's kind of like, like uh, oh, the reflective thing, that's mellow, that was really nice. Then public narrative, you know? And then, and then woo, organizing, you know? This is like, does this make sense? Yeah. See, because it's getting more and more dependent on others. And so then that kind of interdependence winds up being an important catalyst for self-understanding. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here. And so then the challenge is, how to get over the barriers, you know? How to, how to get over the barriers enough to get into that domain where the real learning is. And I don't know, I mean, we've had people who have been doing that. I mean, I, what do you thought about how to, how to leap over that barrier so that you're able to get into that other domain? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, no? I mean, I certainly have, I've read about certain barriers. I mean, I've read about it's challenging to ask other people for things. It's, it's challenging to assert my own authority. It's challenging to, um, you know, get other people committed. It's challenging to take. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this. So I'm curious, uh, folks that that have been kind of leaping over this. How how have you been doing it, Mona? Yeah, good. <coughs> Very, very open for rejection. I have to be very open for uh, reliance, and this irritates me. It, it, I mean, extremely irritates me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready 
to do miracles uh, as long as I don't have to rely on someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so what happened? But then, uh, because of this project, <laughs> <laughs> You might remind people what the project is. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a, a campaign against a study group that is, uh, we see as um, anti-diversity in, uh, in Harvard. And um, and what I realized that I, 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 I simply cannot, I, I cannot do it alone because it's, it's more about, uh, like, like this case that we have uh, seen, uh, you can only realize it if you are together. And then in order to come out of my challenge go to people and, and talk to them one to one and uh, talk about myself and listen to himself and these things that I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, new for me and uh, and only I, I managed to do it only when when my eagerness to succeed tipped uh, over my 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 anxiety to come out and ask and rely and have this interdependence. When, when this eagerness uh, was, was more, I, I just jumped over this barrier. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that I'm now like very good in this, but at least I have seen myself doing it, and I have now a memory that, well, I have done this before, yeah. and I can yeah. do it again. And at least I've created a precedent. And, and, what, and what form did jumping over the barrier take? <coughs> well, what did you do? I, I felt with people that uh, I felt that I um, I don't have enough common things with them, and uh, I had to 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 explain myself yeah. and to uh, to get them uh, easy and, and relaxed to explain themselves. Yeah. And that was for me it was very uh, totally new. And then to start uh, selling, pitching uh, what I think falls in our uh, uh, common area. Yeah. And uh, and that was the I mean the peak of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, and I'm really interested in this uh, this uh, how did you put it the eagerness the the, the that source right yeah. you could bottle that and sort of uh, <laughs> yeah where do you think that came from? comes from? I mean, was it just like there's the pressure there's a peak coming up oops I gotta do it. no what? No, I I think that because I've chosen something that relates to to myself to yeah. my values and things and I had to go and dig and, and relate to these values in order to give me the strength to, yeah. to push this, this thing that I have done before. And how did you actually get into action? Because I know you did work with your committee first, but you've actually taken some initiatives here, huh? Well, I don't know. I... <coughs> you had an interesting meeting the other day. Yes, but that's that was kind of the culmination of our work together. Uh, but uh, I think uh, jumping over the barrier happened like a couple of weeks before that. Before that, working with the committee. Just, um, we've been reading one of his papers, and it's really interesting about forming the committee and then moving the committee, it seemed like, to a place of action. Because it didn't sound like it was ready to do stuff, especially. And then actually taking the initial step, which was a meeting with Graham Allison, yeah. um, in which he totally uh, drew the wool over your eyes? I don't think so. Drew what? No, it's the same, like, like he totally uh, fooled you. <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. No, no. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, yeah, how would you just describe? Could yeah, you yeah, yeah. Was oh yeah, Nada, you were, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was, uh, we, we thought that we didn't have the power to, to, to move the boss, like he's saying here in the, <laughs> in the case, but he actually moved. And, uh, and Why do you think he moved? I think because we showed persistence. Yeah. And second, because we showed that we are not like four people who are angry, just angry. And, um, and because we had very specific uh, asks and that sounded very reasonable and cut into their 
book of rules and regulations about diversity and culture. It sounds like Gandhi's moral jiu-jitsu using their values uh, to call them. Yeah, no? yeah, I want to say, and actually, to, to Mona's credit, because after this meeting, um, I think I found myself being, you know, pleased with the, with the outcome and, and being happy that he was kind of so sympathetic to our cause and all these things. And, and we were going to send a, a thank you email to him. Um, so Mona and I were talking, and I was ready to be like very like, oh, thank you for so graciously, yeah, you yeah. know, listening to us. And I think she helped remind me that like our asks from the beginning have been very reasonable, and yeah. this is a very practical thing, and that, yeah. and that like it goes back to the whole like, am I does my theory of change so fundamentally rely on like someone else like graciously allowing me to have the power to speak for myself? Like, I think that's really hugely different. Hugely different. Hugely different. And, and there's a tendency to be deferential and grateful for notice when there's a power difference. And you know, it's a, that's one of the things that in what we read about the union organizing with, with James trying to get at is trying to break that pattern of, of deference. No, this is an equal deal here. We're 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 entitled. You have your place. We have ours. We're now we're bargaining something here. This is not like you know I'm down here and you're up there. And it, part of changing it is simply acting differently. And it sounds like that's one of the things that happened to your reading, in, in your reading. Now, because uh, just the other part, I, Graham was trying to get you to, oh, the students go organize that, the Belfer will organize the other one, and I think you came back and said. Well, I told them, why, why, why did the students have to organize this? I mean, Belfer is organizing this study group, then let them do another uh, study group for another perspective, yeah. and be responsible to, to create this diverse uh, uh, See, this I take as another really important moment in this meeting of where, where the attempt was to try to push it off, but they kept putting it back. Say, no, this is your responsibility. And I mean, it has to do with a very, um, how would you describe the presentation about Islam?
I might need to step up a little bit more and um, to really move the work forward. So that's so what happened. What did you do? What would happen? <laughs> um, well, we've basically been in this like long extended process of making a decision about what we were going to work on and um, I ended up just sort of deciding that I needed to pitch something more concrete and that was the idea of the resolution. So I was able, um, right before spring break, I like, called everybody up and like, okay, we have to, are we on board with this? What do you think? And everybody seemed on board. So um, what I wrote about in my reflection paper was then when we came back from spring break, I'm like, okay, now we're gonna plan the, the resolution. But even then, like realizing that people were still not quite getting it and especially not getting how it fit in with our broader theory of change. So I kind of moved out of my normal facilitator role to like go through and like really lead us through a more structured conversation about what is our theory of change, how are we going to get there, what do we need to get there, and then was able to frame the resolution as a good first step towards getting there. And since then, I feel like people are much more invested in, in this particular campaign. And we're, it's, it's helping us move forward in all of our other goals as well, not just for this campaign. So in just more outreach and recruitment and <coughs> visibility in the community. How did you feel after this happened? Um, I felt good. I mean, this is, it's still like a question I'm, yeah. I'm working with. I think it will be forever. <laughs> How did you feel before but it happened? I felt very frustrated yeah. and like not really understanding um, what was missing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, the sense I got was it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, this question of claiming, uh, claiming, a per claiming your own authority in a circumstance um, where you may not feel entirely authorized or you may not feel whatever, but that's part of the role. In, in other words, you know, what Jane was doing with the hospital workers or, or the team, that's part of, that's what the leadership, that's part of what the leadership piece here is. Not to take it away from people, but to enable people to find their own pathway. But if, if your pathway is unclear, and if you're murky, and, and sort of, oh, I'm going to, how do you ever get there? And then it just becomes really frustrating. Uh, and, and so it's not like getting over that, you know, is kind of a, um, oh, now the world is transformed. But possibilities begin to shift. Uh, different sense of self, I think, comes into play. And people tend to regard you differently and respond to you differently. So, I mean, who else on this on this deal? I mean, is this is this useful what we're talking about right now? I mean, because yeah. certainly we have the sense that that this is a kind of key issue <laughs> uh, is is finding a way to break through these the, the barriers around exactly what we're talking. And and it's sort of like the conceptual stuff comes, you know, but it's even hard to get some of the conceptual stuff if you're not on the other side of this barrier because it's like theorizing swimming. You know, I mean, I've got my great theory of swimming. And, uh, and they would say, well, now, how would you design a strategy to win an Olympic swimming contest? <laughs> oh, well, let me theorize how to do it. it, it, it it's, uh, the concepts, you know, you have to get in and do it in order to be able to access the concepts in a meaningful way, if that, if that makes sense. And that comes back to this question of courage and support and all this other stuff. Yeah, Kevin. Um, I was just going to say that I faced a similar tension that Juliana did, the tension being whether to pitch my own ideas, having sort of thought through yeah. my own theory of change and everything, and trying to coach a whole room of people to exactly the same conclusion that I had reached, right? And I felt like I was all tidying the ball yeah. when I was trying to do the latter. And I, I think this was not, I don't know whether this was conceptual confusion, because um, in my mind, I was trying to figure out what an organizer was meant to do. Like, where, where am I adding value to this process? If all I'm doing is telling other people to come up with ideas and not <coughs> adding my own ideas to the mix. Um, and so I think the, um, just, just so everyone knows, my project is to uh, organize Asian Americans at Harvard uh, against professional discrimination later on in life uh, by building mentorship connections both within Harvard and without as well. Um, and I think the way um, I got there in the end was I actually tried to do what we did in coaching. Uh, 
Uh, but um, I realized that if I was right and I had reached the correct conclusion, then I should be able to ask people the same sets of questions that people like Marsha and yourself were asking me. And we should all reach a similar consensus. And if not, then I had probably messed up somewhere along the, the way. Uh, and the outcome was that I had messed up somewhere along the way. Uh, so people did reach a different consensus, but I think it was a better one for it. That's a great example, too. I, and I, th I think the whole thing, I think it's a terrific example. Uh, you know, because then things surprise you. You learn, actually. You know, and so you're holding it in here. It's just like, you know, as you were talking, I was just, you know, uh, it's going to be Passover next week. And I was just thinking about, as you were talking about Moses, um, that may, well, why, why did you remind Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's it, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, no, it's interesting because the, the, in the situation where uh, Moses is walking along with his sheep and he sees them glow off the side of the road and, and he steps off the road and sees this bush burning and it's not consumed and that's when, you know, the voice comes, Moses or Moses, you know, different, different theories about that. But it's, it's, it's the longest dialogue in, in, the, um, in the Bible. Um, and it's really interesting because it's God saying to Moses, you need to go do this. Now, you can sort of say, well, um, it's God. Why didn't you just tell him to do it? It's a, it's a whole process of argumentation and persuasion. You know, you sort of say, well, why? Why is that built into this text? I don't mean to get off into religion, but no, but I mean, really, why is it, why, what's the point of all that, do you think? Why isn't it just God says, Moses, do this, Moses, do it? What's going on there? What are they trying to teach, do you think? I'm shifting ground here to religious studies, but no. Moses, maybe Musa, same guy. What, what do you think? Um, yeah. To identify the solution by ourselves, but you're motivated by it as well as to be told what to do. Yeah. And that's something that happens in Harry Potter and no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, which Harry Potter reference? Yeah, no, I think. Eleanor says, this ambiguous statement, I guess it's a Shall be, shall blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he says, why can't you stop here, me? And that's because you have to arrive at the solution yourself to be able to motivate, to be able to get motivated by it. And that's really interesting. I mean, that's a great, I, I'm going to have to go look at which Dumbledore passage. Give me the chapter and verse. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, the Harry Potter books are great. Uh, but I mean, uh, yeah, all these sort of, um, you know, whether it's um, Tolkien or whether it's Game of Thrones, which started Sunday night, you know, the new, the new season starts at 9 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, uh, they're all about these kinds of questions, though. They are about dealing with the unknown. They're dealing with what's threatening. They're, how do you find courage? There's how do you figure your way through and how do you engage other people? Because it's fundamental to the human experience. I mean, these are the questions we carry around with us, and that's really at the heart of what we're dealing with here, is, is how to manage that, is, is how, to, how to find the emotional resources to be able to develop the skills and the conceptual understanding that comes with this. And, and I think that's kind of a lot of where, where the action uh, is. And I, I mean, my understanding of that whole conversation between God and Moses is, is what Chirani is saying. It's like, it's got to be a choice. It's about agency. It's about the fact that for, for it to be uh, consistent with our dignity and our capacity as human beings, we have to be able to choose. And it's very different than being told or compelled or required. And so the process of engagement and coaching and all that is about developing the muscles we need to you know, be who we can be with each other. And it's like, um, uh, uh, I think, yeah. Who was saying, I was a Pat, right at the beginning about the people, yeah, the people in San Jose who through that whole process grew. That's what this stuff is. But it starts with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can talk about the chain of coaching. Yeah, it starts with us. And that's, that's what this stuff is about, uh, I think, and where it can become very powerful. So, uh, yeah, Eric? Just to add on to it, I think the additional challenge we would face, too, is what the outside prevailing culture is in. Is there, there's still this American individualism that is looking for one person to have the solution and the yeah. answers, and so it's we have to work against that mindset with ourselves and with our teams, and then also outside. Like, why are you doing this together? Like, you have a solution, you have an idea, go do it. Uh, and 
that's really hard. I mean, you're, like, I'm wearing this tie, so I'm going to meet with like a funder. The funders want to know, like, what is your solution to this problem? Like, I don't know. It's who I'm working with. We're going to figure it out together. And they're not. They're not happy. Yeah. <laughs> like, Let us know when you figure it yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Give me some money to figure it out. And there's that frustration too on the outside, as sure. well as what we're trying to build. Uh, I really appreciate that. That's absolutely right. You know, it's absolutely right. It's, it's funny. There's a lot of this stuff is embedded in the wisdom traditions of so many cultures, yet we're, there, there's something else challenging that pretty powerfully. And we're kind of, kind of at the cusp of that, I think, right now. Okay, let's get some takeaways and then some pluses and deltas from today. What are some takeaways from today's conversation, discussion, reflection, rumination? <laughs> yeah. Um, in thinking about the three different challenges, whether it's interpersonal relationships, concept, or myself. Yeah. For me, I look at it as myself and uh, or the challenge of growing in my own character and all that. Because I look at the other two as um, my interpretation of those things makes those things difficult, even when, when it comes to relationships. Yeah. It's the interpretation of the it's my interpretation of the relationship that will create the tension or that right. will make it something that I can't actually handle or will make it a problem versus it being the relationship itself. So for me that just it helped me think about how the buck starts here in that I need to be kind enough to myself to be able to learn and grow and and um, work through all these these different challenges. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, Michael. I found Mona's case very insightful today, and sort of what I take away from me is like, in order to shift this power imbalance, you know, I can change something, and I can step up in order to, to make this more equal. Yeah, thanks, Mona, and, uh, and Juliana both for, yeah. yeah. What else? Yeah. Um, intentionality and being strategically minded is very important. I heard you played violin in this section. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're going to have to, uh, he's a concert violin player, isn't he? Uh -huh. yeah, you're going to have to share that with his time. I will. Yeah, good. <laughs> what else? Other, other takeaways? Other takeaways? Yeah, Mona? Yes, engaging the community doesn't mean that we want what we want. That doesn't mean we want what we want. It's a really uh, very important thing. It's, uh, no, let's listen to them really and see uh -huh. what they want. Them into what yeah, and we might even learn something from that, like Kevin over here. What else? Are there, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Words uh, are much to be needed, uh, not to let it cripple you, acknowledge it, you name it, recognize it, there it is, uh, and deal with it. You know, that's kind of that's kind of the challenge here. Um, uh, pluses and deltas is a very quick, uh, what was most useful for your learning today? The case discussion? What else? Uh, I, I follow that, but case discussion of Mona's case and Juliana's case. Yeah, particular. living cases. Right. Yeah, it's a combination of living case, well, let's say, you know, past cases and yeah. present cases. Good. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. What else? Yeah? The delta, um, 
uh, in terms of we're going to focus um, on specific case on, on two of three specific cases in the class that we can find that out a little bit earlier yeah. uh, in terms of our own time management. Yeah, we had we decided yesterday to make this adaptation to try to deal with this thing we were just talking about. What else? Delta's yeah? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody's normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Yeah. Oh, last. Yeah. I like that we talk about union organizing as well because we focused on community organizing.